Awesome. So, um, yeah, I want to first thank uh, Jonathan, Vittorio, and Bruno, and all of the organizing committee for this, for this wonderful track today. Uh, I want to thank all my uh, research collaborators, some of which are, are listed at the bottom of this, of this slide, and I want to thank all of you for staying at the end of this long but really stimulating uh, day. Um, so today I'm going to present some of my postdoctoral uh, work asking how to best combine um, the, this very general question that uh, a lot of you may be interested in, how to get the best of both worlds, how to best combine machine learning and physical knowledge. And because I'm an atmospheric physicist, I'll do it in the particular case of developing uh, data-driven yet physically consistent models of atmospheric convection for climate modeling. So to give a definition, uh, atmospheric convection is, is broadly defined as any atmospheric motion driven by air density differences. Um, as you uh, seeing here in this movie of uh, a North American monsoon storms, and what you can immediately see is that atmospheric convection uh, transports tracers very fast in the vertical direction. Here you're seeing dust, uh, but for climate modeling purposes, we really care also about temperature and water species. And because of um, the major importance for the vertical transport of energy between the ground, the atmosphere, and space, we it, um, resolving convection in uh, climate models is really important to make robust long-term climate projections. Um, now, the problem is that um, you would love uh, if you took a grid cell of your climate model or uh, more generally now we call them Earth system model when they're integrating several different uh, models of the Earth system. We would love the clouds, uh, which are the signature of atmospheric convection to look a lot like what you would take um, uh, when you take a photo from the picture of a plane. Uh, but in practice, um, because we need to run a lot of uh, different um, processes for hundreds of years on the global scale, we have to make computational compromises and that means we have to use a very coarse grid and this coarse grid distorts the, this vertical energy transfer that uh, I just mentioned, uh, which means that for a given emission scenario, uh, the largest uncertainty in our long-term climate projection still mostly come from the representation of convective and cloud processes and that's the first motivation of this talk. The second motivation is that for um, a little more than uh, 10 years, uh, almost 15 years now, uh, several centers um, have invested enough uh, resources to be able to run models globally at a grid scale that's, that is fine enough to explicitly simulate deep convective storms. So that's going below the five kilometer horizontal resolution scale. Now, uh, the simulation I'm showing and uh, the other the other simulations by different countries, they're extremely expensive to run, so we're not gonna be able to do it for hundreds of years before at least 2060. Um, but now, in the meantime, this gives us a ton of data that we can learn from, um, and what machine learning can do then is to be trained on these global high-resolution simulation to accurately learn how to mimic those kilometric scale convective processes. And so, um, to give you a little more context, I'll, I'll show you the setting I will be using uh, during this talk. Um, so the setting I'm gonna use is called a uh, super parameterized climate model and it's a co compromise uh, between the global cloud resolving model I just showed you and traditional climate models. So, uh, let's, well, maybe I'll use the, the mouse, uh, okay. So on the left, you have uh, what looks more like a traditional climate model. So the, um, for now, it means that the horizontal resolution is roughly order 100 kilometers. So you definitely cannot resolve uh, storms. Uh, but uh, in each grid cell, uh, you embed a two-dimensional cloud resolving model, which, ex um, which has a, a resolution of three or, or even less kilometers and can explicitly resolve storm. And what is nice is that by using the set, this setup, it's a very clearly defined machine learning problem where you can just learn the effect of these explicitly resolved storms on the core scale climate and then close your subgrid scale thermodynamics equation. So the idea is just you replace that with a neural network, then you couple it back to the climate model and you get the benefits of high resolution, but you can run the whole thing much faster. 
So all the neural networks I'm going to present today are try to mimic atmospheric convection and they'll have different setups, but the common point is that uh, it's a mapping from one vertical column to another vertical column. What they take as inputs is the large-scale climate conditions, what you would get for, from a coarse climate model. So insulation, the full vertical profile of temperature, the full vertical profile of, of uh, water vapor mass concentration, and surface enthalpy fluxes. And then the goal is to output the effect of uh, fine-scale uh, storms um, and, fine scale, uh, and turbulence at the scale less than that uh, climate model scale and how these processes redistribute temperature in the vertical, water vapor in the vertical, and then radiative fluxes because we really care about them for, for climate modeling. And so without further ado, that is um, how well uh, those neural networks perform offline. So that is uh, when you train them before coupling back to the climate model. So on the left is um, how um, uh, uh, storms redistribute water vapor um, in the middle of the atmosphere, and on the right, how they redistribute temperature in the vertical. Uh, on the top is uh, the truth. In this case, it, it's, uh, it's model data we're trying to emulate, and at the bottom is, is uh, the neural network uh, prediction. Um, and what you can see is that uh, you really have to, to squint to see uh, the differences. Of course, you smoothing out a little bit of the variability. Here I'm using uh, artificial neural networks. Um, but overall, it's really impressive given the complexity of the task at hand. Um, and recently, um, neural networks have really permeated the field of atmospheric science. Now I'm, use, I'm showing you uh, an example uh, from numerical weather prediction by uh, Jonathan Wayne, um, who was at uh, the University of Washington, now at Microsoft, and he keeps improving on his uh, data-driven uh, weather prediction model. And here he's able uh, to forecast uh, near surface temperature up to a month uh, in advance uh, without using any physical model, I mean, except for training, of course. Um, but you can see that it's really accurate. Um, and he uh, did this uh, thing that we thought was impossible. He just got rid of the dynamical core, and so that's a purely data-driven weather prediction. And that asks this really provocative question is, can we eliminate physics entirely? That means, um, can we um, avoid explicitly encoding physical knowledge in the algorithm we use to make atmospheric prediction, knowing that we'll still need a physical model to train um, our machine learning algorithms. Um, and what I'm hoping to convey today is that maybe um, that could be appropriate for initial condition problem like meteorology, numerical weather prediction, but it may not be a great idea for boundary condition problems uh, like climate, where the Earth is going to be subjected to condition it has never experienced before. And uh, the answer is no for at least three different reasons. Um, physical consistency, uh, interpretability, and uh, generalization ability. And I'm going to briefly um, show you what I mean by each of these problems. So first, um, physical consistency. The problem is if you train a standard neural network um, for performance, it's going to take shortcut. And by taking a shortcut, it's going to typically violate conservation laws. So I'm going to show you the residual from the mass conservation equation and the moist enthalpy conservation equation. You can just think of that as a measure of energy. Um, and so if a neural network was perfectly conserva conserving energy and we would feed a batch through it, uh, the residual from both conservation equations would be close to a delta function at zero. Now in practice, if we do feed a batch through the neural network, we get uh, this full uh, histogram of uh, physical law violation. Um, and if you compare that to the signal um, we're trying to resolve the response to, which is, for example, a doubling of carbon dioxide produces a, an energy imbalance at the top of the atmosphere that's around five watt per meter square, um, it's really a problem if we are uh, dissipating uh, more uh, mass and energy at every time step uh, than the whole signal we're trying to resolve uh, the response to. Now, second, uh, for, um, machine, for the interpretability problem, um, so uh, several speakers already mentioned the problem um, of the black box. And uh, because neural, inter neural networks are hard to interpret, they're hard to trust. And here I'm showing you why you shouldn't necessarily trust them. So um, that's a neural network that's not performing very well and that's coupled back to a climate model. And then it leads to a really dramatic instability. And what's really cool here is that the instability is resolved. You have the time to see the climate model crashing. So you can see on the right, 
uh, very dramatic internal gravity waves being emitted before the, 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 model, the climate model completely crashes. Now, um, why would you trust a model if you don't even know beforehand if it's going to be uh, stable at all when you couple it back to the climate model you um, use to make prediction? The last problem I want to mention is the generalization ability problem. So this is a typical prediction we have to make um, in the tropics. Uh, here it's a daily mean prediction I'm asking. So that's the true. That means it has to uh, learn that uh, storms redistribute uh, or, or uh, storms and clouds and fine scale turbulence redistribute water vapor in the vertical following this profile. And here, if I take different neural networks that perform uh, pretty well given the complexity of the task at hand, and here I'm including uh, neural networks that I'm going to present to you that were engineered to conserve mass and energy, uh, they do pretty well in the reference climate. Now, if I take um, the same setup, but I warm the climate by 4 Kelvin, uh, then all of a sudden they fail by quite a bit. Um, so they're unable to generalize to unseen thermodynamic conditions that come with uh, global warming. So these three problems motivate the questions I'm going to ask today is how can we design uh, models of a convection that are data driven but that remain interpretable and physically consistent and that's linked to the broader question um, that may be applicable to, um, in a lot of your uh, research is how to best combine machine learning and physical knowledge. Um, and that's really at the root of, of now what's a, a full field because things are evolving so fast which is called physics guided machine learning. And that field, that subfield aims to add physical structure to restrict uh, the output of machine learning algorithm to physically plausible solution. Um, so if um, we can uh, schematize it really simply um, by uh, going from the models that have uh, the most, so we're now looking at hybrid model combining um, a statistical model and a physical model and we can rank them by how much physical structure they have. And I want to argue that in atmospheric science, we have a really long history of um, creating hybrid models. And I think the, most, um, the two most common examples are uh, what we do when we fit climate models. You have a, you have a fixed uh, climate model structure, but you have uh, unknown parameters because you don't fully understand these processes. And then you're gonna, you can learn the parameters of uh, that physical models uh, using data. So um, this gives you a lot of interpretability and reliability because you know which equations you're integrating, but you'll never be able to represent, it what's, uh, to represent what's not already encoded in your equations. Now you can be a bit more flexible and that's, you know, when you look at your forecast on your phone, that's what's happening. Um, it's a physical model is run to give you weather prediction and then we use a statistical model to bias correct uh, these predictions. So that's a bit more flexible. But then um, what I want to do today is, is start from a, a mostly unconstrained model. So start from an artificial neural network and go the other way, like add the minimal amount of physical knowledge to make them consistent, interpretable, uh, and able to generalize to unseen climate. Um, and just with the interest of time, I'm going to have to be quite fast, so I'll, I'll give a quick overview of how, to sol how we solve each of these problems, uh, but then we'll have time for question. Um, and of course, you, um, all the three pa papers and preprint um, are out, and so uh, if you're interested in the detail, um, you can uh, read them. So the first problem I want to tackle is that uh, the lack of physical consistency. So the fact that neural networks typically violate conservation laws. Um, and as the previous speaker nicely introduced, a very classical way to do that uh, that you can see in the research literature is to uh, physically constrain the loss function. And the reason it's so widely done is that because it's quite easy to do. Um, and it's quite reliable. All you do is you introduce a penalty whenever the neural network uh, violates conservation laws. It's similar to a Lagrange multiplier. Uh, so for example, you start with your loss function, you have a term reserved for performance, you just ask a term that punishes the neural network whenever it violates conservation laws. Um, and that works well. Uh, the problem is it doesn't work exactly because you still subject to optimization here, and so you have no guarantee that that loss is going to go to zero. In general, for a high dimensional problem, it does not go to zero, and so you'll still be dissipating mass and energy um, at every time step. And as climate uh, modelers, we really uh, didn't want that. So uh, we came up with a pretty general way of enforcing uh, nonlinear analytic constraints um, in neural network uh, to within machine precision. Um, 
And I'll, I'll briefly give um, that uh, method in the context of an artificial neural network. So imagine you start from an input vector of length m and you're trying to predict an output vector of length p um, and you have n constraints. The trick is instead of outputting um, p outputs, you output p minus n outputs and then you calculate the residual outputs using fixed constraints layers so that your analytic constraints are exactly enforced. And then the trick is you do all that um, using the uh, programming language, um, for example, you know, TensorFlow, PyTorch, pick your favorite deep learning language. So you code that within the neural network. Um, and so then you concatenate the whole thing and then the whole vector goes in the loss function. And what that means is that um, the gradients of your loss functions are gonna be propagated through the constraints layer and uh, the final coefficients of your neural networks will depend on the constraints layer. Um, so it's built so that you exactly enforce the constraints, but then you don't lose performance because uh, the loss function still sees the entire output vector. Uh, and so that was published last year um, in PRL, uh, and it's linked here. And uh, taking a step back, um, the idea is that um, we can enforce conservation laws in neural network. In uh, my case, it's conservation of mass, energy, and radiation. But as long as you're able to write your constraints down analytically, the method is general enough so that you can always design your architecture so as to exactly enforce analytic constraints within machine precision with minimal performance trade-off. Um, now, the second problem was a problem of interpretability and trustworthiness, uh, which is particularly important when you're making uh, potentially societally relevant climate predictions. And so our idea here was to uh, tailor um, machine learning interpretability methods. Um, again, the field of explainable artificial intelligence now is a whole field and is booming because things are also moving very fast. Uh, and so the idea is really to take the different XI methods that were developed and then adapt it to the problem of interest. And then I'm gonna show you what you, we did in, in, um, for two methods. The first one is one of the simplest methods you could think of, it's partial dependence plots. Um, you, uh, you, it's, what you do is you average the prediction of uh, your machine learning algorithm conditioned on the inputs of interest. So for example, in the atmospheric case, we wanted to see whether our uh, neural network behaved like observations of storms. So we fixed um, what we call lower tropospheric stability, which controls the occurrence of storms. And then we increased mid-tropospheric um, water vapor. So that's just like the fuel, water vapor being the fuel of, of storms in the middle of the atmosphere. And as we increase that, what we get is the typical signature of deep convective storms. That is, uh, the more intense the storm, the more water vapor is lifted upwards. As water vapor condenses um, it uh, to become rainfall, it loses energy um, that is then um, used to heat, uh, that then mostly goes into heating the atmosphere. So you can see this signature of deep convective storm, which is drying with heating. Um, and that was reassuring. And then another method we had um, a lot of success with because it allowed us to um, solve uh, the enigma that I showed uh, initially is um, what's really nice with deep learning is that uh, the, it relies on the automatic differentiation algorithm, which means it's very, very, very efficient to calculate uh, the Jacobian or the gradient of your neural network. And so you get that uh, Jacobian for basically free. It takes like a fraction of a second and you don't even have to worry about the threshold of the perturbation you put in. And that's really nice because a lot of models in physics rely on knowledge of this Jacobian and gradient. So what we did is we coupled it to two dimensional, uh, so it's two dimensional linearized gravity wave dynamics, but you can think of that as like a really simple model that explain uh, how internal gravity waves propagate so buoyancy waves propagate in the atmosphere and whether it's gonna uh, lead to instability or not. And then you can get a full stability diagram. And then we were able to find our spirits in stable mode and they corresponded to the speed that we saw and we were able to fix it. So then before even coupling a neural network to the climate model, we could anticipate if it was gonna crash a model or not. And so the conclusion is that um, it is possible to uh, tailor interpretability methods, but we've barely started to scratch the surface. So even if a lot of XCI methods are available out there, um, 
I don't think, um, I think we still have a lot to find on how to couple these to what we know about uh, the physical system of interest. And so for example, attribution maps right now are revolutionizing atmospheric science because people are using it to evaluate uh, atmospheric predictability. Um, but as I just showed, gradients um, can efficiently be used as well. Um, and now I'm realizing I was optimistic on time, so maybe I'll really briefly um, finish on the generalization idea. Um, so uh, let's see if I can do it in one minute. Um, so to fix the generalization problem, our first step was to break the model even more. So instead of doing a four Kelvin warming, we're doing an eight Kelvin warming. Um, and then that way, even neural networks who perform really, that perform really, really well, uh, now completely break. They failed by a factor 10 to 100, so we're not in the epsilon. Uh, we can really see which solutions are gonna work and which one don't. And then the idea, which is uh, pretty similar to uh, self-similarity in fluid dynamics and um, also shares some analogy with uh, domain generalization methods in machine learning, was to physically rescale the inputs uh, and the outputs of our problem so as to co uh, convert what's an extrapolation problem into an interpolation problem. And it so happened that uh, for the problem of interest, so wh what we saw is that the re um, right now, if we just look at the mapping we're trying to emulate, so large scale climate to how storms redistribute the properties, um, that mapping is not the same in the cold and the warm climate. And so the goal is to rescale everything so that the mapping is the same, so that once you learn the mapping in one climate, you can do it accurately in the other one. Um, and just because I wanna be respectful of time, um, I'll just say how we did it for water vapor. We know the clausius clapeyron equation, so we know the upper bound of, um, of water vapor uh, given atmospheric mass can contain before the water rains out. And so by using that, we can rescale the input, which is water vapor mass concentration, into a relative humidity. And if you do that, the generalization already works much better. And then you can play this game for all the different variables in that case, because we understand atmospheric thermodynamics quite well. So the idea is we can use, and now I'm just gonna skip to the conclusion. Yeah, we can use um, physical knowledge of climate change um, to then create uh, neural networks that are much more robust. They can generalize better and they can also learn uh, from less data. But overall, the, the takeaway message is that, um, and I think that was shared with the other talks, is that uh, all the knowledge we've accumulated over the past, in our case in atmospheric science, is probably a century and a half, uh, can really help uh, get the best of, the, of both worlds. Um, so the statistical world for accuracy and then the physical world for consistency and robustness. And with that, thank you. And uh, feel free to check out uh, my website if you want to read the details of the research. And then I put everything on archive, so you should be able to read anything without everything without a paywall. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Super interesting to see the different links. We have maybe time for one quick question if someone has one. Um, so, so typically you use higher order derivatives, right? So doesn't this enormously scale down if you, if you have to calculate like third order automatic derivatives using your models or? Um, so it's a, it's a bit different. It's, it's, a, it's quite a different setup as, um, as yours. I, I'm just replacing uh, the whole, uh, I'm just emulating the whole vertical profile using an artificial neural network. So I'm feeding the whole profile and, and I'm just getting real numbers at the end. So uh, it's uh, as long as you feed it enough data, and in our case, we in model world, so we can create like millions and millions. We actually like use 40 million samples to train the artificial neural network. Uh, then you get pretty good accuracy, except in, in regions of the atmosphere where the flow is too turbulent and stochastic, then it, it's not as good, but it's still, we get like coefficient of determination, like all above 0 0.3, 0 0.4, so it's, it's fine. Thanks a lot. So I would like to thank again the speaker. It's a bit fast because I have to respect time.